So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tan Apaydin, and I am doing this presentation on behalf of uh, Dr. Kamer Kaya and Mustafa Sekalsız. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here today. Uh, so if you have detailed questions at the end, I can make sure uh, you guys can call contact with them. Um, so this is not my own work, so I'm not going to get into very high-level details, since there is a lot of math behind this. Um, so uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, so T2 Software, uh, we, we are located in Turkey at the moment, and we are a software company. And for more than two years uh, now, we've been working also on, uh, hyper, uh, also on with uh, blockchain projects. And actually, we have done the first POC blockchain project back in Turkey more than two years ago. And since then, we have been uh, working on a variety of organizations uh, regarding blockchain projects and trying to follow the technology uh, uh, up close. Uh, so I'll start with a sim uh, simple transaction, right? Uh, here, Alice wants to set, send X assets to Bob. Right? We all know this, right? This is the simple uh, transaction in Hyperledger or blockchain. Uh, but, but the thing is, people want to check if the transaction is valid, right? They want to verify if... Um, this, this, this is valid. First, to do that, they need to know the uh, amount, the current amount Alice has, and also they, they want to know the, uh, the transfer amount. Uh, on a little bit more complex transaction, here we have assets that Alice has, uh, A1 and A2, and she wants to send different amounts to different people, like X1 to Bob, uh, maybe X2 to E, right? And she might also want to apply a fee for those transactions. Uh, so how do we verify this? Uh, it's still similar, right? Here we have an inequality here, so we want to make sure that the sum of the assets she currently has is greater than or equal to the total amount that she wants to send out, right? Uh, but the thing is here, we want to hide these values. We don't want to uh, reveal the exact values of A1, A2, X1, and X2, and etc. We just want to uh, make sure that this inequality holds. We don't want to give out any more, more information than that. So we introduced the concept of uh, confidential transactions. Um, in confidential transactions, the, the values are hidden, right? Here, uh, we don't see the exact amounts, but we, we still uh, see these inequalities, and we want to uh, make sure that transaction is valid. Um, in this presentation, we are not actually interested in the privacy of the participants. I think I, Hyperledger has this identity feature right now for that. But uh, rather, we are. Um, with confidentiality, we were interested in hiding the uh, values in the transaction data, right? The, the amount of uh, transfer, the amount of assets people have, the fees and the prices and etc. And this feature is uh, now called zero knowledge asset transfer in Hyperledger. But the mathematics behind that is really uh, complex and um, I think performance wise it's pretty hard to, uh, to grasp. So with these motivations, uh, I'll try to summarize the concepts we are applying and some tools and solutions we, uh, we're going to be using. Um, to get into zero knowledge proofs, uh, suppose that Alice wants to prove to Bob that uh, she knows X, and she doesn't want to reveal the value of X to Bob. Um, so such a proof needs to have three properties, right? First, completeness, which means that if the proof is valid, Bob will be convinced at the end, and we are assuming he's honest, right? And soundness, if Alice doesn't know X, uh, she cannot cheat. And for zero knowledge, if Alice knows X, Bob doesn't learn no more than the information that Alice knows X. Uh, here is a widely used uh, example to explain zero knowledge proofs. So suppose Alice has two balls uh, with different colors, and just so ha it happens, Bob is colorblind and suspicious about if the balls have really different colors. So they play a game to convince Bob, right? First, Alice chooses a ball with, and without revealing its color to Bob. We say she commits to that ball, right? And then they repeat the following steps. Um, Bob takes the balls, and then without showing them to Alice, uh, he switches them with one over two probability. And then he presents them to back to Alice, and then Alice uh, picks the ball she committed to before. So what happens now? In this simple game, uh, if Alice fails, the game immediately stops. Otherwise, we keep playing, we keep going, and then if after some iterations, if Bob is convinced, he stops the game. Uh, in this case, suppose that the balls are identical, right? Uh, if Alice wants to cheat, she can do that. She can succeed in, with 
uh, one over two probability in a single iteration, right? However, if we increase the number of iterations, like for after 30 iterations, that probability goes to a very, very small num number. So it's really, really hard to uh, cheat after some, some iterations. And this simple game also uh, satisfies all those uh, properties, like completeness, soundness, and uh, zero knowledge. However, the problem with this uh, game is it's kind of interactive, right? Both Alice and Bob needs to take actions at, at each step. And such, such a solution might not be always uh, feasible for real life scenarios, right? And we wanna make this uh, non-interactive in, in some sort of, so, sort of way. So let me try to define a, a commitment. We all know this, right? We are working on blockchains and we used hash functions before, right? And this is taken from Wikipedia. Uh, so in an ideal uh, hash function, we have two uh, very important properties here. First, it is pre-image resistant. Uh, th that means it's kind of computationally feasible to generate an input given the output. Uh, that means the function only goes one way from input to output. You cannot guess the input. And it's collision resistant. That means no two values can map to the same output. So given these properties, let's say Alice uses an hash function, and using her data, she produces this output, right? This huge string here. Since the hash function is collision resistant, this commitment uh, computationally binds Alice to X. So Alice cannot use something else for that uh, output, right? She only can use the X. She cannot use some, some X prime or something. And in addition to that, since our hash function is pre-image resistant, um, the commitment kind of hides X from Bob. Bob only knows the output of the uh, commitment, not the, not the input. And if need be, in some uh, protocols maybe, at, at some point, Alice can still reveal the uh, exact value of X. So uh, given hash-based commitments, this is, this is good that uh, the commitment binds the prover to the information, and also it hides it from the verifiers, right? However, uh, what we want to do is we want to kind of arithmetically combine uh, our calculations. And hash functions doesn't allow that. So you cannot add or sum, you cannot add or multiply the output of an hash function, right? And to rescue, we use homomorphism. Um, so here you, you, see, you can see two boxes, right? And they represent two commitments. And we can use, uh, we can use them to compute a commitment on a value that is obtained by only adding or multiplying the original values. So in that sense, uh, we don't want to use these green and red uh, circles. We only have these sums, 7 and 12, right? We, want, we, we only want to use them, not the individual values itself. So for that, we are going to be using Peterson commitments. And it's going to be clear in a sec. Uh, so here is the key point. Uh, you can see a simple homomorphic commitment here. We, we use a function, C of x, right? C here represents, C stands for the commitment. So we use a power function. Instead of using x, we use g to the power of x, and we take the mod p. And p is a very large uh, prime number here, like thousands of bits. And using that function, it is obvious that uh, we can apply the following rule. Uh, C of x multiplied by C of v, y equals to C of x plus y. This is a power function, right? And this is the key point uh, we're going to be applying. Uh, such a commitment, however, uh, computationally hides the secret information uh, because when you use the logarithm problem, uh, it's kind of intractable to go from the output of the function back to the input, right? However, let's say in some near future, we have this nanotechnology coming up, right? And let's say a computational supreme adversary can in practice can still obtain x, right? So we, we, we need to do a little bit more to make that function a little bit more, more complex so that it's hard to uh, figure out the value of x. So for that, we use Peterson commitment. So we introduce another term here, h to the power of r, and where h is a number unrelated to the g uh, here. And we can still hold that property, right? P, PC, Peter, uh, Peterson commitment of x multiplied by PCY, is still equal to PC of x plus y. And we call this additively homomorphic. So the good news is it statically hides the secret x, right? And how does that do that? 
Yeah, even if we guess the values here, like g, h, and p, for every given x, we have a matching pair of r, right? It, uh, so it, x and r pairs are not unique in that sense. So it's very, very hard, computation hard, to uh, guess the exact value of x. So using Peterson commitments, you know, they form the base of uh, confidential transactions on a number of existing ledger technologies. And um, I want to introduce a couple of use cases here. Actually, this is a real life scenario back in Turkey. Uh, we have different banks, and each bank, and they all apply the same loyalty program for their customers. And obviously, they have different POS machines, right? So in this example, we have two banks, the issuer bank, the acquirer bank, and we have an exchange center in between. And this guy over there is a customer of the issuer bank. And let's say he wants to do a shopping and wants to, uh, pay, you, wants to pay his uh, belongings with the POS machines of the acquirer bank, not his own bank, but the other bank. And what happens is, at the end of the day, both banks report to this exchange center, and exchange center spends some time doing his job, calculating what needs to be. And then only the second day, um, the banks pay each other, right? kind of the reconciliation. So it's not real time. So what, what can we do? So using blockchain, this is a simple approach, right? Uh, I think most of us are familiar with this. Uh, if the banks represent an OT you know, on a blockchain topology here, uh, we can do this in real time. But the problem is data is transparent, right? We, we didn't encrypt it. So everyone can see uh, all, all the transactions happening in between the banks. Uh, what can we do? We can use these private channels, right? Hyperledger has these private channels. Maybe these two banks have a private deal in between, and they don't want to share their prices to other banks. Um, but if we apply that, then real-time gross sum is a problem, right? We split the data into two, and then we need to somehow combine them to get the reconciliation, right? Um, one solution could be to use an exchange center within those private channels and then let them do the work for us. But after some time, we have a lot of private channels, and each private channel has an exchange center, right? This, this becomes infeasible. And since we are using blockchain technology, we want to get rid of the central uh, exchange center, right, in the first place. So here comes our solution. So instead of representing the amounts, x, y, and z, we represent them with our functions, like in the simple case here, g to the power of x, right? And if that node sends and uh, makes, makes a transfer of amount A, we still represent that with the, with the function. And data is encrypted, and people can still uh, verify the transactions using ZK proofs. So up until now, um, our examples were only using additions or multiplications. And the traditional cryptography was enough uh, for us. But for, for some other complex cases, we need, full homo, uh, we need full homomorphic schemes. What do we mean by that? So here's a simple example. Uh, let's say Alice has some data, private data, and she wants to make profit using that data. But she doesn't want to reveal that data to third parties, right? She wants them to use it, but she doesn't want to reveal it. So she commits her data parts to blockchain with a homomorphic commitment scheme. And then let's say Bob is a researcher and she needs, he needs some da data to operate on, right? And then he sees that Alice co Alice's commitments are available, so he contacts with Alice. So what happens is Bob sends a function to Alice, and then Alice runs that function on her own data, and then Bob wants to make sure that she actually did what she's supposed to do, right? She needs some confirmation, right? And then. Alice also sends the ZK proof of her data so that Bob can make sure that he actually ran the function on her own data. Uh, Dr. Kamer is currently working on a problem, actually. This is a real, real research going on. Um, so it's a similar problem. Like Alice allows Bob to use her genome sequence without revealing it to anyone, right? She has the genome sequence data. She wants to open that to research, but she doesn't want to actually reveal it. So from Alice's perspective, she wants confidentiality, right? She wants to be the sole 
custody of her genet genetic data. And to communicate with Bob, uh, she doesn't want to deal with third parties. She wants to communicate with him directly. And she wants to make some profit, right? She wants to gain some benef uh, financial benefits from her data. And from the Bob's perspective, she, he also wants to communicate with Alice directly, right? He also doesn't want to deal with third parties. And he also needs her results verified by Alice. Um, so in our real case, we encoded the paternity testing and genomic distance computation with arithmetic operations on polynomials. Since we are using polynomials, let's assume that we map the uh, sequence data to polynomials, right? And polynomials have these arithmetic operations of both uh, multiplications and additions at the same time. So that's where we needed the full homomorphism scheme. And we are currently working uh, with Hyperledger to integrate our solution. Um, Actually, I was supposed to stop here, but uh, since we have more time, I can go over one more use case here. Um, so let's say we apply this letter of credit use case. Uh, we have two banks here. We have one importer, one exporter, two banks, and one reimbursement bank, right? The importer wants to, the importer first communicates his bank, uh, sends the money to the confirming bank, and the confirming bank does some uh, paperwork, and then at the end, ex uh, exporter get, uh, sends the money to the importer, right? And then the reimbursement bank is the central authority here. So this is a typical scenario, right? We, think we need uh, reimbursement bank in the, in the middle, and transfers are made using real life, real, uh, you know, real money, actually. But if you apply blockchain here, any bank can be a, a reimbursement bank. So in this scenario, let's say every bank can issue a letter of credit coin, right? And these coins will be transferable. Um, the other bank can use the, uh, his own uh, letter of credit or the other bank's credit. And for simplicity, let's say uh, we are fixing the value of letter of credit here. So first, every bank introduces their own letter of credits, let's say 30 million here. Bank of America has its own coin and the others have their, they have their own coins. And let's say we want to transfer 12 million. So what happens in a simple scenario is opening bank is, uh, just sends 12 million of its own uh, letter of credit, the ABC here, right? And then the, the Santander, Santander Bank gets those 12 million. But let's say these, these banks are small. This, this bank is very small, and Santander doesn't trust them, right? So they need a coin of a big, bigger bank, like Bank of America. So in this case, the opening bank gets 12 million from Bank of America, and then he adds it to his assets, right? And then he sends it to the, he transfers it to the Santander. So as a business model, here, every letter of credit is credible as its own bank, right? I mean, the bigger the bank or the, the trustable bank is, the trustable this coin will be. And they are transferable, transferable between banks. And every payment is made using the consensus. And here we can still apply the zero knowledge proofs. So that's all for me today. Uh, if you have questions, you know, you can contact me offline or afterwards, and I can make sure uh, you can get more details from Dr. Kamerkaya. Thank you.